Chapter 15 is about methods for visualizing stress and strain in a structural or mechanical part under load. We've used some of these methods in previous chapters, and we'll learn some new methods too. Here's a problem from Chapter 12. It's a beam that's loaded in bending, and it's also loaded in tension. We learned in Chapter 12 how to combine the bending and tension stresses using the principle of superposition. We drew diagrams representing the normal stresses inside the beam as a way of visualizing the stress conditions. The combined stress diagram at the right helps us understand how the stresses are added and helps us see that the zero stress point is not at the neutral axis. It's actually closer to the top of the beam. This diagram also shows that the stress varies linearly from top to bottom. The diagram doesn't show us everything. For example, it doesn't show shear stress, and it doesn't show how shear and normal stresses combine in the meme. Here's another example of visualizing stress. We studied short block problems in Chapter 12. Let's say the applied point load is to the right of the yy axis and behind the xx axis. We solve the problem and find the combined stresses at the four corners, plus 40 psi at the front left, minus 120 psi at the front right, minus 60 psi at the rear left, and minus 200 psi at the rear right. A plan view of the block shows the location of the point load along with the combined stresses at the corners. There is a positive tensile stress at point A and a negative compressive stress at point B. Somewhere along the front edge between points A and B, there must be some location where the stress is zero. We can use similar triangles to find this location. It's one and a half feet to the right of point A. We can do the same calculation for the edge between points A and C. Again, using similar triangles, we find that the location where the stress is zero is two feet from point A. Now, let's plot these points on the plan view of the block, then connect the dots. The combined stress is zero along the dotted line connecting the zero stress points. To the left of the zero stress line, the combined stress is tensile. To the right of the zero stress line, the combined stress is compressive. In the book, there is a contour plot that shows constant stress contours across the block, not just the zero stress line. We can use this stress visualizing technique to understand the stress distribution in the block. Engineers use finite element software for calculating stresses and strains in complicated parts. This software does an excellent job of visualizing stresses and strains. In the 19th century, before computers were invented, Otto Mohr developed a method for visualizing combined stresses and stresses acting in different directions within a stressed part. One way to think about stresses in different directions is to cut the part and glue it back together, then look at how the adhesive is stressed. If we cut a tensile bar 90 degrees to its loading direction, then glue it back together, the glue is loaded purely in tension. The little red box represents a small element of the glue, which is loaded in tension in the x direction, but not in the y direction and there's no applied shear. Sigma x equals p over a, while sigma y and tau are zero. If instead we cut the tensile bar along its length, 
and lap the two segments with a glue joint, the glue is loaded in shear. Now, our little element of glue has a shear stress, but no applied normal stresses. Tau equals P over A, while sigma X and sigma Y are both zero. Notice that the shear stress is labeled tau sub xy. The book explains why the shear stress along all surfaces of our little square are equal, so tau is the same in both x and y directions. We call it tau sub xy. If we cut the bar along a diagonal, then glue, the glue wants to pull apart in tension and it wants to shear. Instead of doing a bunch of trig, we can simplify the equations by setting up new loading axes, x prime and y prime. Moore's circle requires a series of steps to produce results. Just like in beam problems and the moment of inertia of a compound shape, each individual step is fairly simple. The challenge is to put them together in sequence to get the result that you're looking for. Also, if you make a mistake early on, the mistake will cascade through your solution, so it's best not to make mistakes. In a real problem, there is one additional step. Step zero is to calculate the inputs to Moore's circle, namely the applied normal and shear stresses. You've spent the entire semester learning how to calculate these stresses in beam problems, torsion problems, and tension problems. Now we'll learn how to put them together. This example is a combination of two applied stresses, tension and torsion. Let's skip step zero and say that the applied normal stress in the x direction is 5 megapascals and the applied torsional shear stress is 3 megapascals. There is no applied normal stress in the vertical direction, so sigma y is 0. The reason that we're solving this problem is the same reason we solve any combined stress problem. It may be that the part will survive either tension or torsion, but what if it's loaded in both ways at the same time? The combination of tension and torsion will produce a maximum normal stress that's oriented at some angle to the axis of the rod, and a maximum shear stress that's oriented 45 degrees to that maximum normal stress. Step one is to draw two axes for the graph. The vertical axis is shear stress and the horizontal axis is normal stress. Step two is to calculate the average normal stress. Add sigma x and sigma y, then divide by two to get the average. Next, plot the average normal stress on the horizontal axis. This is going to be the center of Moore's circle. We'll mark this as point C, for center. Step three is to plot two additional points on the diagram. Plot sigma x comma minus tau xy and sigma y comma positive tau xy. These points are on the circumference of Moore's circle. We'll label these points A and B. Draw a straight line to connect points A and B. This line is a diameter of the circle. Step four is to draw the circle centered at the average stress and passing through the two points we just plotted. The radius of the circle is the hypotenuse of a right triangle with a base of sigma x minus sigma y and a height of tau xy. The most common mistake in this calculation is to put a plus sign in the place of the minus sign. That will throw off your answer. If you draw Moore's circle to scale using a compass on engineering paper, you can measure the result with a ruler and then compare it with your calculation to make sure that they match. 
Step five is to calculate the maximum normal and shear stresses. The largest value of sigma is at the very right edge of Mohr's circle, where it intersects the horizontal axis. We call this value sigma 1. At the left edge of Mohr's circle, we have sigma 2. Sigma 1 and sigma 2 are called principal stresses. The maximum shear stress is the high point of the circle. This equals the radius of the circle. Step 6 is to figure out what angle the principal stresses act along. Rotate the line segment AC counterclockwise about point C until it reaches the horizontal axis. The angle that is swept is 2 theta. What does angle theta mean in the real world? Principal stress sigma 1 is oriented along angle theta. Principal stress sigma 2 acts in a direction 90 degrees to principal stress 1. In our example problem, the combination of tension and torsion results in a maximum normal stress of 6.4 megapascals, oriented 25 degrees from the axis of the rod. The minimum normal stress is a compressive stress of 1.4 megapascals acting at 115 degrees from the axis of the rod. The maximum shear stress is at the very top of the circle. This is 90 degrees counterclockwise from the horizontal axis, but all angles in Moore's circle are double angles in the real world, so the maximum shear stress in the real world is 45 degrees above the principal stress sigma 1 which is a total of 70 degrees above the axis of the rod. This second example is a beam loaded in bending. We have previously calculated bending and shear stresses in beams. Now we'll combine them and see what happens. Let's say that we've run the calculations and we get the stress values listed at the top of the screen. Moore's circle is drawn for each point to the same scale. You could draw them to different scales, but one advantage of using the same scale is you can place all three diagrams side by side to figure out which point has the largest stresses. Even better, you can superimpose them. If the diagram doesn't get too busy, you can tell that point number two has the largest principal stresses and shear stress. Even though the bending stress in the x direction is zero at the neutral axis of the beam, Moore's circle shows us that there is a normal principal stress acting at 45 degrees to the neutral axis of the beam, while the shear stresses are horizontal and vertical at this point. There are five fully worked out examples in the book. Example number one explains why the shear lip on a ductile tensile specimen forms at a 45 degree angle. Moore's circle is not intuitive, partly because of what the axes represent and partly because angles are double angles. Think of it as a way to map stresses onto a plane so that we can easily calculate maximum stresses due to combined stress states. It's a useful tool, and it will help you understand results from finite element analysis.